I've attended EGX Res every year, five years running, and always posted up my thoughts on the Electron Dance website. I thought, just for a change, I'd also put them together as a film. It was supposed to be a short film, but somehow it has become a long film. So here is my res in 2019, and everything I've become familiar with at Tobacco Dock. Stairs, fire extinguishers, barriers, trash cans. Garden from Biome Collective was a chill-out game. I thought I was going to experience something like Mendel, where I'd be splicing together different plants to make something new, but what I saw at Rest was more of a musical game. You could pick up alien seeds, there were four types, and plant them wherever you wanted. Each of the four plants produced their own sound, which meant you could make something that sounded quite harmonious if you did a good job arranging your garden. Alternatively, you might just do what I did and plant seeds everywhere and create cacophony. And that's pretty much it. The visuals and audio were solid, although my personal highlight had to be the wriggly alien grass cursor. The developer suggests there will be more to the game than just planting music, but there are no more details right now about ready states or target platforms. A long time ago, in a galaxy far, far away, there was a game which presented you with a simple login prompt. Unusual for games at the time, it issued a title screen in favour of putting you in the moment. What do you do next? It was 1985, and the game was Activision's Hacker. This is War Dialer. Memory okay. Ready. What do I do next? Hacker offered the fiction of breaking into a top secret system, a la War Games, but failed to follow through. It was an early discoverable system, and what you found on the other side of the login prompt was a weird, somewhat cruel fetch quest game which didn't feel anything like hacking. War Dialer, however, is much more war games. The key to a real hacking game is making the user type in the keyboard, or at least a fixed width font painted in green. We've seen Hacknet really go to town with the concept, and Duskers also does a great job of exploiting the command line interface to heighten terror. War Dialer is an interesting halfway house. It doesn't take long to get hacking, and the player must match the target system to a suitable exploit, which in the early game felt more like digging around for a password. A lot of the initial information comes from an enormous repository at the hacker site, which I think tests the player's patience a bit too much. Still, War Dialer only implies hacking, because it seems more interested in narrative. I'm not sure how to view War Dialer as a hacking game, or a twine with an elaborate interface. I completed a simple hacking operation, which then led the protagonist, I think, to recount a memory, I think, and then the game reset. I broke into a few other systems but felt I'd lingered too long and left War Dialer for other visitors to crack. War Dialer is a solo project from Paul Kildiff Taylor, one of the co-founders of Note 7. It has not yet been released. This is all you do in Big Harm from Colour Fiction. It strikes me as the kind of thing you could leave running in the corner of your room while you go about your daily chores. It's free to download, so why not try it? Be transported to a world of pores. Exhaust Lens from Sand Gardeners was made in three days for Ludum Dare, so no one should be expecting world-class polish here. Look, I didn't have the first clue what this driving game was about, but how could I? There were post-it notes everywhere, coloured stickers, a map you were encouraged to draw on, cheapers. I'm just gonna grab the wheel and see if I can figure out what is going on. I engaged with it on just one level, as a driving exploration game. I was on the road, travelling across a dark, moody, monochromatic map peppered with ASCII buildings. Travelling from point to point took a while, and more than once I began to suspect I was on an infinite road to nowhere, only to hit a sign, or a fork in the road. Uh, how big is this game? The realisation there was more to it came late. You could enter buildings, and there was an overarching goal. Apparently you're fighting fascism. But the only memory I took away was of a lonely drive through a remorseless, unrelenting darkness. Unsure if there was anything out there at all. 
I should not be surprised to discover that Into the Black was an inspiration for the developers. What the hell is that? Balloon Bound from Awkward Silence Games is an in-development local multiplayer game. Pop your opponent's balloons so they plummet to their death. I had a blast with this. Oh yeah, I played this a lot. Somehow the quirky physics combined with environmental randomness such as other balloons and weapons added up to something rather special. Your basic arsenal is an infinite supply of deadly paper aeroplanes, which you can throw with great force if you charge up the shot. You also have at your disposal a formidable kick. I can't be sure, but if you were a consistent loser, it seemed the game would kit you out with a more powerful weapon instead of deadly paper aeroplanes, something like a gun with bullets. This really isn't a game about different weapons though, because they seem almost incidental when you have two naked wimps kicking at each other's balloons ineffectually, floating up there in the clouds. Weapons often make the rounds come to an end quickly, but they seem more for comedic value than tactical. One of my opponents got a water gun at one point, which didn't seem to function my balloon but was really annoying. But then I got a flamethrower and he was literal toast. That was my favourite moment. The last proper tower defence game I played was Hidden Path Entertainment's Defence Grid The Awakening from 2008, so uh, it's been a while. Enter Empires and Ruins from Hammer and Ravens. On the surface, and I stress on the very surface, Empires and Ruins looks like classic tower defence. You build towers, aggressors come at you along to find paths. Towers can be upgraded but also find themselves under attack and need to be repaired. You have power-ups which provide a temporary boost and take time to recharge. Super! Tower behaviour can be tweaked in all sorts of ways but naturally this was too much for the first time player at a video game expo. You have limited builders to make new towers and if they're out in the field when the new wave rolls in, they can get killed, which makes it feel a little RTS-y. I was shown some enemies carving out new paths along the map, and I'm told they can also tunnel to escape the wrath of your towers. There is also a campaign map on which you are reclaiming the lost territory of your empire and ruins, and losing a battle will set you back. I did not get to see this in the demo, but you have to manage your reclaimed territory carefully. Each region is vital to keep resources flowing to the front line, and you can be betrayed. Oh, and there's also a tech tree to research. Empires in Ruins has been in the works for several years and is still in development. Nth Dimensional Hiking by Zachariah Chandler was quite forward about being a discoverable systems exploration game and that it wasn't for everyone. Although, there is no such thing as a game for everyone. It has a curious pixelated look with chunky scan lines resembling the old Freescape games from the late 80s, although note the player's avatar is not subject to scan lines helping it stand out from the environment. But you know, I got nowhere. Maybe it wasn't for me. I tried to escape the bus stop at the beginning, no dice. I did manage, after much thrashing around, to catch a bus, which ended the game. It looked like the kind of thing I dig, but I was stamping this one with the word fail in giant red letters. I walked away from the game. It was done. Later, I saw someone playing it and flying. How were they doing that? Of course I had to go back for a second go. The mistake I made was to assume this walking simulator type game only used the button A in the controller. Once I opened my mind to other buttons, the game began to open up to me. Then I got stuck again after I'd hopped across a couple of floating islands. I walked away from the game. It was done. Then, the unthinkable happened. Something which has never happened before and will never happen again at rest. I went back to play the game a third time. I broke through my second impasse and managed to reach much larger and more exciting structures at the far end of the map. I would guess the structures are simple in design, but the obfuscating graphics draped in hard shadows makes the world feel much more noble, almost alien. However, hiking doesn't feel hostile or threatening like, say, Nason C. It's an odd little thing which is still in development. A preview build can be obtained on Itch.io for Windows, Mac and Linux. Still in development, Omno is a chill-out exploration adventure game by Jonas Mank. Collect energy, find funky rocks, unlock portals, solve little puzzles. 
stomping, dashing and teleporting feel delicious, although frightening creatures that are dropping white blobs of energy felt a little cruel. There was a slight discoverable system feel to it, where the player has to figure out the game mechanics rather than be handed them in a tutorial. That may change, of course. Not sure I'm keen on the jumping puzzles, but I got lost in the discoverable systems, and I mean good lost, not bad lost. May prove to be a lovely diversion when complete. I have an imaginary love-hate relationship with Natalie Lawhead's work. Whenever I see one of her works ambling down the street towards me, I always think, you know, that's not my kind of thing. I'll just cross to the other side and let it pass. But sometimes I don't cross the road and then I have warm, happy feelings. Then again, I haven't tried out everything is going to be okay, nor run once in which you get a downloadable friend that you can run once, but never again. Forget about Citizen Kane, I was worried Run Once was the game equivalent of Bambi's mother getting shot dead. But anyway, I sat down with Lawhead's Cyber Pet Graveyard at the Rares Leftfield Collection. To blab too much about a work like this kills it, a bit like what happened to Bambi's mom. It is very silly, and if I tell you about why it's silly, I'm going to be robbing you of those moments where you too get to think, oh gosh, this is silly. It is about Cyber Pets that were developed for a game in the early 2000s. Yet they were so unlikable and unwanted, they were never released. But finally, digital historians have rescued them. Cyber Pet Graveyard reflects 90s tech nostalgia in a similar way to titles like Hypnospace Outlaw and Subserial Network. It doesn't present itself as a single application, but more of a collection of broken files, a forgotten digital wilderness to explore. Windows File Explorer literally becomes an exploration. The usual line between the game and desktop is disrupted, because the game inhabits your desktop. This all sounds serious. It is not serious, it is very silly. If you want to check out the silliness, you can download it for free. I found Ludopium's Vectronom hidden away in the recesses of the indie basement room. I thought, I'm going to get me some of that action. And after getting me some of that action, I then shook one of the developers vigorously, demanding to know when it would be released. Ah, oh, that's enough hype. Chill out, y'all. This isn't No Man's Sky. Vectronom is a rhythm-based isometric platformer where the obstacles in each level move to the beat. During the levels I played, I had to avoid pyramidal spikes and watch out for the floor disappearing underneath my, um, feet. One wrong move, and my cube avatar was either smashed or fell to its death. Vectronom is not like Super Hexagon, where you are constantly on the move, but if we insist on Terry Kavanagh metaphors, then it's more like VVVVVV. Observation, practice, muscle memory. Learn the correct sequence of moves, then perform them with a the beat. Quick to pick up, hard to put down, Vectronom reminded me of Crypt of the Necrodancer in the way you embrace music through play. Frustrating in a good way, as it makes the victorious highs that much sweeter when you vanquish a tricksy level. My favourite stage had a thin circle constantly contracting to a line and expanding back to circle. That required some seriously fancy fingerwork on the keyboard, and god, it was joyous. Vectronom also supports two players, but the players work independently. Only one needs to get to the exit, but when both players are performing the exact same actions, things get a bit confusing. When I brought my son and his friend to rest on Saturday, I made sure I put them both in front of Vectronom. And they loved it, like I knew they would. Look, Vectronom is brilliant, okay? The Twisted Tower from Pocket Money Games has that just one more go hook that good casual games tend to have which must avoid baddies and collect all gems. The game arena is 2D with a 3D twist. It is set inside a tall cylindrical mansion and the balconies are all rotating in different directions and at different speeds. And if you encounter a beastie just once, then your little witch is toast and it's time to start over. I got through three levels before I decided to call it a day. You don't want to hog a seat for too long and like those people who insist on playing through the entire demo of my friend Pedro for half an hour. The spinning balconies stir in uncertainty, you do not know if you're going to run into a monster or if a monster is about to drop over a ledge that you want to jump up onto, especially as the breakneck pace forces you into split-second decisions. It felt a little bit like a lost arcade game. 
Pocket Money Games tells me it will be out on PC, Switch and PlayStation later this year. Recompiled from Fi Games is a work-in-progress third-person platformer set in a now-familiar digital landscape. Hard neon edges, metallic sheen. A child of Tron, I've always been a sucker for this aesthetic. Recompile was pretty. If you're expecting me to tell you about some um, groundbreaking mechanics, I've got nothing. Recompile went through the platformer fundamentals, jumping, switches, shooting. As you explored, twisted glitched areas reassembled into structures. What this doesn't put across though, was that there was a real punch to the execution. It felt good. And then Recompile gave me the power of the infinite quantum jump and well, I was sold. Instead of the basic double jump, it gave me an infinite jump. I could infinite jump wherever I wanted. And the best thing was jumping crazy high into the air, then letting yourself fall. The impact on Terra Virtua Firma creates a shockwave rippling out across the tiles, making you feel like you're a goddamn superhero. And after that, the demo gave me the ability to hover. There was a real danger. I might not have left my seat. A remake of a 1986 title called The Sentinel, your goal is to take down the Watcher on each island. The Watcher hovers at the highest point, its gaze searching for you. In the other world, you have no physical presence. Your soul can only exist within a motionless totem. You need energy to build a totem, which you must drain from trees or existing totems. The constraint is that you can only build on or drain from tiles that you can see, so any part of the island above your totem is out of your reach. Thus, you use totems as stepping stones to climb the island gradually. Once you reach the top, you should be able to drain the watcher's energy and end the level. I was impressed with the stress this relatively simple design exerts on the player. It is drenched in tension. You feel the watcher's gaze inch closer and closer, yet to look behind to see how close would waste precious time and possibly lead you to ruin. In truth, you can grow a new totem quite fast, yet it feels like an absolute eternity. Anun the Otherworld is now available on PC from Steam and Itchio. Three years ago, I heard the birth of Doggerland Radio. Amy Godleyman picked up on my criticism of the rapture is here and you'll be forcibly removed from your home in Into the Black. She found the mystery of the various narrative fragments you trigger enticing, but it all went up in smoke when she realized she was piecing together color-coded streams of Lovecraft stories. And then last year, Godleyman hits me up on Twitter about a mystery of her own. It took a little longer than two years, but I'm done now. You're welcome to attend the opening this Friday, or any of the five days the show is running. Though I'll be carrying it about to any games event that'll have me from here on. She had created something called Dogland Radio for her MA degree, referencing our brief comment exchange, but I couldn't make it to the show. In a darkened corner of the rare's left field collection, there was a desk. Upon the desk sat a radio and some other items. A small sign above it said, Doggerland Radio. Oh my god, this was it. Doggerland Radio is what Amy Godleyman imagined the rapture is here and you'll be forcibly removed from your home to be. Power up the radio, slide on the headphones, and turn that dial carefully like a safe cracker to find broadcasts orphaned in the static. Maybe you'll catch a little opera, the sound of a steam train pulling into the station, or maybe even the shipping forecast. During my childhood, I had no television and certainly no computer, but I did have a radio. I spent a lot of time twiddling with it, trying to find a station I hadn't heard before. Hiding underneath the crackle, I'd occasionally catch the semblance of something unfamiliar, and if I turned the dial just right, I might be able to make it out. The Doggerland radio stations are constantly running, regardless of whether you're listening or not, so it always feels like you're tuning into the middle of something, conveying a fragmented impression of the fictional Doggerland. Accompanying the radio was a map, some stones, and an old novel. As I was ready to leave Doggerland Radio behind, I thought I'd take a quick peek inside the book. It was out on loan from the Doggerland Library, and had passages censored, and there was an envelope tucked in its pages. I half expected it to contain some love letter from a dead age, but instead, I found what I would describe as just another faint signal that might be relevant, but then again, might not. The work done by Paul Hayes on the engineering and coding here is superb. 
effortlessly evoking the sensation of twiddling with an old radio. You come across these little spots where the static hums and roars violently, for no apparent reason. Wonderful touches. I don't know what I participated in, but I loved it. And I'm afraid you won't be able to grab Doggle and Radio in the shops, or even download it from Steam. All you can do is hope that Godliman brings it to a games expo near you. Fact. People said Ape Out was cool. Confession. Sometimes I do not check out the stuff people say is definitely cool. Second confession. I didn't actually play it at rest, but I wished I had. In Ape Out, you're an ape escaping from captivity, no doubt in line for some nasty experiments. Its closest cousin is probably Hotline Miami, hyper-violent with a fragile protagonist who can die easily, so must kill or disable all enemies with speed. Hotline Miami is fast, requires memorization, and a single mistake can end your run. Ape Out is procedurally generated so calls for reflexes, not rehearsed dance, and is necessarily a little more forgiving. Better still, Ape Out is a genius fusion of game feel, sound and visuals. The game is silhouettes and jazz, turning into Saul Bass Title Sequence Simulator 2019. Paint the corridors red, until the game palette changes, and then you could be painting in orange or purple. Gabe Cazillo's Ape Out was in development for five years. Jesus, I'm tempted to buy this right now and make a game shock at 120 on my desktop. Miklo Studio is following lonely sci-fi permadeath adventure out there with a sprawling Cold War-esque turn-based espionage game called Sigma Theory. There's a new science in town called Sigma Theory and whoever has it will probably take over the world. Your job is to gather the few scientists who know what it is to make sure your country is the one doing all the taking over. That's the game in Sigma Theory, but what about the game in Sigma Practice? I've been fortunate to have a crack at the game at home since dabbling with it at rest. Choose four agents and send them off around the world to find Sigma scientists. Then acquire these scientists through abduction or seduction, or turn them with money or ideology. Every action can have undesirable consequences. If your agent's activities are discovered, there will be diplomatic repercussions and your agent may have to flee that country. The more scientists you capture, the faster you progress to the Sigma Tech tree. And your ultimate goal is to reach the far end of the tree and unlock the singularity which will change the world forever. Other countries are doing exactly the same thing, sending agents out to nab scientists, including yours. I was so close to winning my last game, but then lost every scientist. Two were abducted, two had their loyalty bought off, and a fifth died from a drug overdose, which I, uh, personally sanctioned. And then I accidentally catapulted the world into nuclear annihilation. Yay! I'm still wondering why Sigma Theory wanted to know the nationality of my spouse. To be safe, I kept my Japanese Sigma Theory wife happy, just like in real life. As it's early access, Sigma Theory suffers from glitches and the occasional miscommunication. However, it is undeniably tense and a little exciting.